and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Ari Glogauer, Assistant Professor of Law at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. We will discuss his article, A Constitutional Wealth Tax, which will be, which will be published in the Michigan Law Review. So welcome to the show, Ari. Thank you, Brian, and uh, thank you for emphasizing the the in <laughs> as a trademark and and copyright professor. I couldn't help myself. The uh, controversy has been in the news lately. Right. Well, at least it's raising awareness of the issue. So <laughs> <laughs> there, there we go. Well, so I got to say that this paper is so timely right now and really kind of a fascinating way of thinking about potential problems with uh, a, a form of taxation that a lot of people are talking about that many, I think, people might not have anticipated. So I, I was wondering if you could start by explaining to listeners what exactly a wealth tax is. Right, like, what would it tax, and how would a wealth tax be different from the more familiar income tax? Sure, and uh, you know, just as a uh, as a introduction, I I'm, I've been interested in the relationship between income and wealth and the progressive tax system, and I kind of thought maybe these maybe the topic of wealth taxation will be interesting to a broader audience about 10 years from now. Um, and then life comes at you fast. And it is exciting to see this conversation happening now. Uh, so as to the question of what is a wealth tax and how it differs for some, from some other tax instruments that we might be more familiar with is, you know, as a starting point, it kind of depends who you ask and people mean different things by a wealth tax. If it just means a tax uh, instrument that tends to impose a greater tax burden on the wealthy, then in one sense, a capital income tax could be thought of as a wealth tax to the extent that uh, taxing dividends, interest, capital gains has the effect of burdening wealth. You can also think about an estate tax as a once in a lifetime wealth tax on your net estate. And this paper in particular is thinking about what I describe as a traditional wealth tax, which is measuring wealth in a different way, which is uh, simply uh, taking some measure of your net asset value, the taxpayer's net asset value each year. Typically, they're structured as net of your debt, and there could be exemptions for either a dollar amount, or there could be exemptions for certain types of assets, for example, such as personal property or real estate, and then taking this net asset value and then imposing some rate of tax on it. For example, think about the structure of Senator Warren's proposal, which follows this basic design structure. Mm -hmm. So with respect to the kind of wealth tax you're talking about in this paper and that Senator Warren and others have been talking about, are there any kinds of taxes that people currently pay that might be characterized as that kind of wealth tax or at least similar to that kind of wealth tax, just to provide a kind of a basis for comparison? Yeah, so we don't explicitly do this in the federal tax system. But we do a form of this with uh, the property tax as uh, states and uh, local taxing jurisdictions impose a tax based on your the some measure of the asset value of your property, which could be thought of as very similar in design to a wealth tax. Uh, what Senator Warren and others have proposed would just be a broader measure that would account for more assets than this. Right. Okay. So... You're talking about the possibility of a wealth tax at the federal level, and the title of your paper is a constitutional wealth tax, right? So that, that implies that there are potential constitutional <laughs> difficulties with a federal wealth tax. Sort of what limits, if any, does the Constitution put on Congress's ability to tax, and how would those be relevant to a wealth tax? Sure. So uh, the question of whether there are possible constitutional limits on a wealth tax, uh, whether those exist or not, I, I want to be clear, it depends who you ask. And I, in this paper, I talk a little bit about some of the views in the prior literature. So I, I want to 
I want to make clear, I'm talking, I'm I'll refer to some of the potential constitutional limits, and then people interpret these in different ways. So uh, starting with Article 1, Section 8, this is a provision that gives Congress the broad federal taxing power, and this was seen at the time as necessary to you know, support the nascent state and to replace the former system under the Articles of Confederation uh, that um, – for requisitions from the states, which were very uh, impossible to collect. Uh, so Article 1, Section 8 provides this broad power. And then the potential limitations that uh, some point to, uh, one is the, or the most important one perhaps, is the apportionment requirement for direct taxes. And this appears in Article 1, Section 2, and then again in Article 1, Section 9. And the basic idea is that a direct tax, whatever that may be, uh, has to be apportioned among the states in proportion to the population of those states. And when you think about what this would actually mean for a modern progressive federal tax, is it, it would render such a tax imp an impossible if you had to apportion it. And this is because if you had a state that had a higher proportion of the population than of the base for the tax, whether that be income or wealth, then the individuals in that state would bear a proportionally higher burden, even though they had relatively less ability to pay. Uh, so that's why it's typically considered that if, for example, a wealth tax is subject to the apportionment requirement, that is, if it falls under the category of a direct tax, uh, that, that would effectively preclude a uh, federal wealth tax. So just, 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 just to be clear, though, I mean, it would, be, it would be technically possible. It would just be really unfair. Yeah, and, and that's an interesting side argument in the literature about whether, uh, you know, whether the framers could have possibly intended for it to be possible, but effectively impossible, even though, as you say, technically possible. And there are some early examples of Congress actually apportioning uh, federal estate taxes, uh, not in the modern era, but in you know, the 1800s, which are kind of interesting case studies. But honestly, I'm not, they obviously weren't, didn't have, um, didn't become central features of the federal tax system. Of course not. Of course not. Um, so, so sorry. I mean, I, 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 I interrupted you there, but, but, but I was wondering, but I was wondering if you could, if you could talk a little bit about what that means, right? So you've said that the constitution says that direct taxes have to be apportioned and that that would in effect make a direct tax, practically speaking, impossible because it would be so unfair. But what does that mean? Like, what is a direct tax as opposed to, I guess, an indirect tax? Right. So this is this is a famous question, both in the case law and in the prior literature. And people take really different views on this question. Uh, there's there's certainly a lot of um, primary materials that suggest that the framers didn't have a clear idea of what exactly a direct tax meant and certainly didn't have a clear sense at the time of exactly which taxes would be covered uh by this label. Uh, so, you know, one argument in the literature uh, by Professor Eric Jensen is that, broadly speaking, direct taxes were thought to be unavoidable taxes. And uh, others have questioned whether this could have been, um, this could form the basis for a meaningful taxonomy or dis distinctions between taxes. Uh, others have argued that uh, for, so, for example, Professor Calvin Johnson argues that direct taxes, if you actually look at how the term was used contemporaneously, uh, it could have been understood to apply to a very broad scope of taxes, could be many things, could be direct taxes. But he uses that point to emphasize that it, it, they couldn't possibly have intended for all these different taxes to be subject to apportionment. Uh, Professor Bruce Ackerman also argues, and also Professor Calvin Johnson, that maybe the ambiguity at the time was actually a feature and not a bug, and they tie the apportionment requirement 
to the um, compromises over representation uh, and you know questions of rep- uh, slavery and representation for slave, which, uh, po- which which they argue points to the absurdity of using this as a meaningful restraint on the modern federal taxing power. And finally, or they argue that this wasn't tied to any necessarily any underlying principles of political economy, but rather expediency and compromise. Right. So, I mean, I, I think a lot of listeners might not be aware of the long history of this controversy and the extent to which it's already kind of been the subject of constitutional uh, controversy and amendment. So, I, And in your paper, I thought you did a really lovely sort of concise way of laying out how that developed. I, I wonder if you could just kind of give a, a potted version of that, kind of starting with Hilton, proceeding through Pollock, and then like sort of why this has all of a sudden become relevant again today. Sure. So the very early cases, starting with the 1794 case of uh, Halton versus United States, was this famous case of a tax on carriages uh, which the court, uh, you know, such as it was constituted at the time, upheld this tax on carriages without really making some clear declaration of what exactly the direct tax definition was. Uh, Justice Chase and Patterson, they suggest that, well, perhaps a tax on real estate uh, and perhaps personal property could uh, constitute a direct tax, uh, but was what was much more important to them was the their understandings of the scope of the federal taxing power, and they took a, more, a much more functional view of the provision rather than delving too deeply into the text. It, it, it's, and how the, how were they able to distinguish the carriage tax in that case? Interestingly, they make this seemingly formal distinction between taxing the ownership of the carriage per se and its use. And as long as the subject of tax is the use of the carriage, they were able to effectively sidestep this question. Uh, what, the last point that's interesting about Houghton is that, you know, this predates Marbury versus Madison, and it was kind of, un, you know, other uh, subsequent cases have characterize it as a colloquy more than a holding or a, as we would think of it in the modern sense. Mm, mm, mm. So what I mean, but what happened after that, right? Because it seems like there was sort of a period in the Civil War mm-hmm. where there was some discussion of what the scope of the federal taxation power was, but then it really came to a head mm-hmm. in the late 19th century when Congress was thinking again about income taxation on a federal scale and coming in con- conflict with the Supreme Court. Yeah, so you've seen these discussions pop up. Really, they've largely tracked the instances when Congress needed to raise new revenues in times of war, uh, Civil War, a Spanish-American War. And during these periods, really uh, throughout the throughout the end of the 19th century is the courts really just uh, deferred to the this functionalist view in Hylton and found ways to avoid this question of characterizing various taxes as a direct tax. For example, taxes on the receipts of insurance companies, on banknotes, on uh, the Gained, even in uh, one of the early income tax cases in 1864, uh, President Lincoln's income tax was upheld, uh, taxes on the succession of estate and personal property. And one of the be- one of the key ways to do it was drawing out this distinction in Hylton where the subject of the tax is something else other than the mere holding of you know, forbidden property, so to speak. And then, of course, the constitutional amendment, right, to make the income tax constitutional. How does that bear on the question of what we mean by direct versus indirect taxation? Right. So between these cases and the 16th Amendment, then you have the infamous Pollock cases, with Pollock cases and it came down in 1895 uh, on on the question of the 1894 income tax, the you know first attempt at the modern income tax. And here the court overturned this posture of deference to the federal taxing power in the prior cases 
and instead took a different direction and read the direct tax definition and the apportionment requirement much more broadly and potentially as a significant constraint on the federal taxing power. And in the second Pollock case, this was the one that held that taxes on per personal property or the income from the property, in addition to real estate, were also direct taxes. And uh, that that really threw the whole question of the scope, the question of the scope of the federal taxing power open again. And as I talk through in the paper, there were some cases subsequent to that time. Now you're in a world where an income tax was considered to be unconstitutional. Some cases uh, subsequent to Pollock, the court was able to uphold, for example, taxes on corporate income and other things using some of these similar distinctions back from the earlier cases about the formal subject of tax. And then you get to the 16th Amendment that uh, where Congress or, or where Congress has the explicit power to tax income without apportionment. And a few things that are interesting about, first of all, the history of the 16th Amendment and the debates about whether to um, draft it more broadly to allow for taxing wealth and to, or to state uh, articulate whether Pollock was right or wrong. Ultimately, the 16th Amendment sidestepped all of that and basically said whether income, a tax on income would be a direct tax or not, Congress, and, and without, without explaining exactly what falls under the scope of income, all the 16th Amendment provides is Congress has the power to tax it without apportionment. And for much of the 20th century, to the extent that the federal government has largely relied on income taxation, the individual and the corporate income tax systems for revenue. That's kind of pushed a lot of these constitutional questions to the peripheries of tax law. Uh, there are many cases about the definitional boundaries of income, but beyond that, there's this unambiguous power to tax income as a starting point. And what's interesting now is now that we're considering some of these new tax instruments that may fall outside this power, these constitutional questions are bubbling up again, and you're seeing um, more interest in them among the tax scholarship as well. Right. So as I understand it, then, the problem here is that the 16th Amendment said that Congress could tax income, but it didn't say anything about Congress and direct taxes. And so the problem then would be that if a wealth tax is different from an income tax and a wealth tax is a direct tax, then a wealth tax would have to be apportioned and that would be impossible. It, it, am, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, you're right. That's exactly right. There's a couple steps. So, you know, it seems implausible that a wealth tax would be covered by the 16th Amendment, although that's in a sense, what I try to argue in this paper, uh, in, in, in one sense, uh, but then as you suggest, there would have to be that second step, whether a wealth tax is outside the scope of the 16th Amendment or not. Uh, you'd also revisit this question of whether a wealth tax is a direct tax, and you'll see these arguments about whether Pollock was wrongly decided or functionally overturned. And it becomes a question of Halton, the Halton paradigm versus the Pollock paradigm. Mm. So as you note in your paper, it, it, it seems like some scholars think that a wealth tax in the sense that's currently being proposed would already be constitutional. I, I wonder if you could kind of give a brief account of why they think that that's the case and whether or not you find – their arguments kind of compelling, I guess, primarily in relation to like, what do we think the Supreme Court would actually do with them? Sure. So, so, you know, I, I, as a, I, I would, I would put it like this. I personally find these arguments strongly compelling. And this, this paper and this project was meant in a way to provide a uh, orthogonal view or maybe a complementary view for why a wealth tax should be held constitutional. But I don't mean to suggest that 
this is a, ne a necessary argument because these prior arguments in the literature are mistaken. Uh, it also goes back to a question of constitutional interpretation and a lot of these prior arguments, they sound to one degree or another in questions of original intent or original public meaning. And this paper is not a paper about originalism in any sense. But the basic views in the literature, and this again is uh, Professors Bruce Ackerman, Calvin Johnson, Don Johnson, Walter Jeff Dellinger, is that the, um, that it, basically going back to, broadly speaking, going back to these functionalist arguments coming out of the very early cases, that the apportionment requirement and the direct tax definition were fig leaves meant to be uh, a, a, an ambiguous bridge to uh, agreements on these more pressing constitutional questions about representation. In uh, Professor Ackerman's account, they were also fundamentally tainted by their connection to questions of slavery and representation. And what's really interesting in Professor Johnson's account is he argues, he provides evidence that the founders didn't even understand how a direct tax and apportionment would operate and how it would even create a challenge for, uh, for a federal tax instrument. And, you know, so Professor Johnson argues that he characterizes the apportionment requirement as a glitch or a mistake, a relic from essentially this is how the requisition system works, worked under the Articles of Confederation. But he argues that it was never intended to hobble the taxing power. And then Professor Ackerman also provides this argument, well, what do you do about an estate ta a tax on real estate? And you do see the even from the early cases, the court arguing, okay, fine, maybe a tax on real estate would be a direct tax subject to apportionment. If there's any substance to the set of direct taxes, maybe it's just real estate or proper, possibly personal property. And then to justify a wealth tax, you have to say that a tax on a broader scope of assets that could include real estate is qualitatively different than a tax on the subset of just real estate alone which I think makes sense as an argument if you're going back to a functional view of the intent of the scope of the federal taxing power. Uh, it is another step in the argument that does need to be made in order to justify a, a tax on a broader scope of assets that includes real estate. Right. So, I mean, in your paper, you kind of propose almost a way of sidestepping the entire constitutional question through what you describe as a wealth integration alternative. <laughs> what does that mean and how would it work? Because this is like the really cool and I think conceptually interesting move in the paper. Yeah. And this, again, it, it came out of my general interest in the relationship between income and wealth as factors in our taxpayers' ability to pay and as potential bases for taxation. And this is one way of thinking about the constitutional dimensions of this relationship. So the basic idea of wealth integration is possible. So you, you have this kind of dichotomy that we've been discussing in the literature that Congress has this um, unambiguous and relatively broad power to tax income under the 16th Amendment, maybe with some limitations on what constitutes income. And then you have these other potential problems with the uh, wealth tax the implication is that it would be subject to a qualitatively different analysis uh, at, in the question of whether it's a direct tax or not. So wealth integration thinks about, uses the, a, a specific method of taxing income and wealth to explore and collapse this dichotomy in the literature. So the basic idea of wealth integration is as follows. So we have an income tax, and what we mean by this is we use income as the taxable base, you know, how, what were your wages or your capital income for the year, and then we perform on the operations on this base to translate that base into your final tax liability. We make adjustments for deductions and exemptions. We apply a rate structure that could depend on all sorts of things, your marital status, the character of your income, 
And then we allow various credits uh, against your tax liability for, you know, children, earned income tax credit, all sorts of things that are separate from the amount of your taxable income, which is the starting point. And the idea of wealth integration is pretty simple, is just thinking about using wealth as an additional factor in determining your final income tax liability. And for example, if you have more wealth, then you may be eligible for uh, a less of a deduction or an exemption allowed against your income. If you have more wealth, you could be subject to a higher tax rate on your income, or you could be disallowed credits against your income tax. And then using this hybrid instrument, then the paper explores the, constitution, the possible constitutional analysis of this scheme. And then from there, thinking about its possible implications for what we've been talking about as a traditional wealth tax as well. Right. So, I mean, to the extent that there are potentially legitimate constitutional objections to a wealth tax as kind of conventionally conceived, would any of those objections apply to the scheme you're proposing? And if not, why not? Well, so this is a really, this is the core of the paper and it's an interesting question. And as I argue, it goes back to this formal distinction between the subject of tax which the court has consistently upheld as that which is subject to these potential constitutional limitations. And then what, what I call the basis for tax, or in some of the cases, it's called the measure of tax, which is thinking about the factors can be used to determine the ultimate tax liability due on that subject of tax. So for example, in the case of, I'd mentioned there were some cases after Pollock, but before the 16th Amendment. So for example, in the case of uh, Flint versus Stone Tracy, uh, the court held that you could have a corporate wealth tax, or I'm sorry, a corporate income tax, where the measure of the tax is the income, even though you couldn't formally tax income as an independent subject of tax under Pollock at the time. And this may seem like a purely formal distinction, but as I argue in the paper, it's not just a matter of, it's not just a matter of the doctrinal precedent. It would be really hard to disentangle this from the structure of the income tax that we have now. As I argue in the paper, we actually do have examples of what I would what I would characterize as wealth integration in the current income tax, where we actually do adjust your, we have rules that adjust your tax liability, sometimes indirectly, on account explicitly of a measure of net wealth. And moving more conceptually from the doctrinal to uh, why the tax system might have, have evolved this way, is it, it goes back to one other potential constitutional restriction that the court has uh, diminished almost to a nullity. And this is right back in Article 1, Section 8, when Congress has is granted this broad taxing power with the run, one requirement that the taxes should be uniform throughout the United States. This is the uniformity requirement. Now, uh, what the heck does uniformity mean? In older cases, taxpayers argue that this uh, required some degree of equal treatment or consistency in imposing tax liabilities on different taxpayers and arguing essentially you can't adjust these tax liabilities on the basis of these additional factors or individual circumstances. And the court has read uniformity almost out of the code and or out of the Constitution entirely uh, by holding that it only requires some, possibly some modicum of geographic uniformity. And commentators have argued that the reason for this diminishment of the uniformity clause was necessary to preserve the core of Congress's taxing power and the ability to adjust tax liabilities to these individual circumstances. 
And ultimately, when you think about wealth integration and you think about why the court has distinguished between the subject and the measure of tax uh, throughout the case law, uh, you get to the same point about the court being in this position of having to continuously second guess the scope of Congress's taxing power and uh, really the scope of Congress's unambiguous power to tax income under the 16th Amendment. Could that possibly mean, for example, that uh, you could tax, Congress can tax income, but not with a progressive rate schedule that taxes higher income earners more than lower income earners? Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. So your your wealth integration alternative, to the extent that it avoids the constitutional or potential constitutional problems with a sort of more conventional concept of a wealth tax, does it have any functional differences from how sort of people are conventionally kind of conceptualizing what a federal wealth tax would look like and how it would work? Yeah. So one thing that is interesting about this, and this goes back to maybe what the core of the substantive uh, the substantive significance of the of these distinctions between the subject and the basis slash measure of tax is that uh, if you don't have the subject of tax in the first place, you're not going to be able to impose any tax on any of these variables that subsequently adjust the amount of tax due as the basis or measure of the tax. So, for example, if you had uh, if you taxed wealth through wealth integration by adjusting the amount of your income tax liability. It, the effective burden on wealth would be wholly contingent on the fact of you having uh, an income tax liability in the first instance. And as such, there would be an effective ceiling on the amount of wealth that would be taxed, which would be, which would be determined by the amount of wealth that you have beyond which there could be any effect on your income tax liability. And that would vary based on the design or the method of wealth integration used. But there would always be that ceiling. It would have the effect of taxing your first dollars of wealth up to a ceiling, but not wealth above that amount. Right. So as I understand it, I mean, would it be wrong to say that in effect, it would kind of be like a wealth tax on income? I mean, that's one way of thinking about it, although you can flip it around and redesign it as a... Um, you know, as a you can you can you can think of it as a tax on your income adjusted by your wealth, but you could rewrite the provision as a tax on your wealth that's limited or adjusted by your income, and and I think that's what gets at the this is the final step in the paper is thinking about the implications for a traditional wealth tax as well. If it's only this matter of pure form about whether you think about it as a tax on income adjusted by wealth or a tax on wealth adjusted by income, then you're at a point where the scope of Congress's taxing power would depend purely on the labels that Congress used to define the tax. Uh, this is assuming that that the court were to uphold wealth integration methods as a tax on income adjusted by wealth, then the distinction be between that and a, as, and a tax on wealth adjusted by income becomes vanishingly small and purely formal. Yeah, no, and this is really interesting because it seemed to me like a big part of the paper was kind of showing how the concept of income and the concept of wealth are sort of almost like weirdly fungible in relation in relation to the tax power in a, in a sense and that it's like impossible to make the kind of necessary constitutional distinction between the two is is that right yeah yeah and there's different aspects of this fungibility and this goes back to where we had started you know, in one sense, you can indirectly ta you can tax wealth in a fashion by taxing capital income, and then that's one aspect of the interchangeability. And the Sixteenth Amendment, it's clear that Congress can tax capital income, uh, even if it can't tax the wealth. And this is, I would think of this as a different aspect of this relationship or this collapsibility of the concepts. Here, we're still formally talking about income measured as some net flow 
of uh, resources over a period versus wealth as some net stock of resources as observed at some discrete point in time. Um, but then again, thinking about using one as, a, a, as an adjustment to the tax liability due on the other. And ultimately, this comes back to what it means that Congress has the power to tax income under the 16th Amendment. And I think the big picture of the paper is that a broad reading of the apportionment requirement, notwithstanding this deep unambiguity, uh, this deep ambiguity about whether it was ever intended to have any bite, uh, could really start to cut into the bone of the unambiguous grant of power to tax income under the 16th Amendment. And I'd, I'd be interested if a court would want to go there. So Ari, I, I wonder if in closing, you could talk a little bit about this kind of burgeoning conversation around sort of the concept of a wealth tax and where you hope that conversation goes you know, moving forward. Yeah, you know, it's it's been an interesting conversation and you, you see different views among policymakers, you see different views among academics, you're seeing... Uh, some response, which is, well, why do we need to tax wealth? We can just double down on an improved income tax, perhaps through uh, mark-to-market reforms, taxing income more accurately. Um, uh, you see other arguments. I think Senator Sanders, was uh, his, his approach would be uh, an estate tax as a way to tax wealth. And what's interesting about this is that there is this certain path dependency in our conceptions of what you know the right basis for taxation is, probably due in large part to the historical fact of the 16th Amendment. We're used to an income tax. We're, we used to be used to estate taxes. Uh, but it is interesting now in this moment to see this more open discussion and consideration of the full scope of possible tax instruments and ultimately, what, what, what's interesting about a wealth tax in particular, as opposed to, say, an estate tax or a tax on capital income, is I think a wealth tax more explicitly highlights the differences in economic power among different taxpayers in a way that may be obscured to a degree by a tax on capital income or even an estate tax. Uh, should we be measuring people on the basis of their relative income, their relative capital income? Or is there something about your stock of saved wealth that affects your relative ability to pay and your role in society? You know, in the end, you could tax anything. You could tax shoes. You could, uh, in the end, ultimately, it it really matters what the relative tax liabilities and tax burdens are on different members of society. But our choice of the tax base also has something to say about what are the relative economic differences and how we compare people in a progressive tax system. And that kind of goes back to some of my previous papers on this topic. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Arya. This was really a fascinating and deep dive into kind of conceptual issues in federal taxation. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Tax my soda and my ginger ale But put a tax on woman and we'll all go to jail What would I do on a beautiful night If I should happen to fall If you're gonna put a tax on beautiful vamps 
Let me be the guy that runs around with the stamps. So don't put a tax on the beautiful girls, or I won't get no loving at all. I do without love. You can tax my business and all that I own, but have a little pity, leave my pleasure alone. What would I do on a beautiful night if I should happen to fall? What's the use of taking all the joy out of life if it's gonna drive me back to loving my wife? So don't put a tax on the beautiful girls, or I won't get no loving at all.